on this week's episode 3, Intriguing Tales. In Brighton, UK, two British army friends meet captivating German women, only to witness their sudden disappearance. Then, in Los Angeles, a couple's routine drive takes a bizarre turn when they encounter a man whose face transforms into an eerie entity. Lastly, we unravel the enigmatic legend of Zerzera, the lost city of the Sahara, where ancient secrets lie buried beneath the sands. Join us as we navigate these extraordinary stories, challenging the boundaries of reality on this thrilling journey through Strange Pathways. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Strange Pathways. I am your host, Scott Mort. I'm having a pretty good week. I hope you're having a good week too. A, a couple of things right off the bat. If you're so inclined, w one of the pieces of artwork that has gotten the most hubbub, <laughs> I guess that's the right word for it, definitely the biggest reaction is the Eyes Like Caverns. It's way, way back in, in a previous episode. It was the Spike Island encounter. Well, now, if you like, Strange Pathways has put out a t-shirt, the Spike Island encounter, with that picture that just gave so many of you the creeps. So that is, that's available right now. Link down below in the description. Uh, another little bit of business, a lot of you I actually got about three emails going like, hey, you're not getting rid of the podcast. Are you? No, podcast is staying right where it is. You'll get new episodes every Sunday. But I have decided to do a little bit more. Uh, back whenever I first started this channel, a lot of this was like green text and AI voice stuff. And I got out of that. And honestly, I kind of miss it. So I'm, I'm getting back into that. To keep it separate from the podcast, I'm titling them Whispers from the Abyss. We put up the first one of those today. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. I, it takes a little bit of the vocal strain off me, puts it right over to that, that computer-generated voice, and really allows me to do some editing, which I really love. I really love putting together the videos and editing them uploading them and it's stuff that i normally wouldn't get to talk about on the podcast so please if that's your cup of tea check that out if that's not your cup of tea no worries no worries strange pathways will be here for a long time to come now on to this week's tales Our first tale takes us back to 1990, Brighton, the UK. The witness, who's decided to remain anonymous, uh, he remembers very vividly it was the year 1990. Desert Storm, Nelson Mandela being uh, freed from prison. He and three friends were serving in the British Army, and they traveled to Brighton for just some rest and relaxation. It was a warm warm summer that year in Brighton. Now, the witness and Andy, his friend, they decide to go for a walk along Brighton Pier. Now, if you're not familiar with Brighton Pier, it's amusement upon amusement upon amusement. Arcades, ice cream, food. Just a beautiful little place to go. While Andy and the witness were there, they meet and speak to two young German girls from Nuremberg, and they hit it off immediately, despite, that's a train outside, I'm sure you heard that, despite the language barrier. The girls speak broken English, they know a few words of German, and they're kind of making the girls giggle with their fake World War II German commandant accents. You know, it's, it's all in good fun. This lasts for hours. They laugh, they joke, and pretty soon that language barrier becomes less of a distraction. 
Now, one of these girls was blonde, the other was a redhead, and they both were beautiful. The witness says they were way out of him and Andy's league, but the girls liked them, and they wanted to know more about them. They, these two soldiers, though, they were awkward. They were in their teenage years, and they couldn't figure out, uh, Andy, I think the blonde likes you. I think the redhead likes me. No, I think the redhead likes me. You know, they can't figure out which girl is attracted to which man. But they just kind of let it go and decide it's just nice to get some attention. After a little while, they all decide they're going to meet again at the same time and place the very next day. The girls leave the pier. Andy and the witness decide to wait at the pier for the other two friends to join them. Overnight, you know, that whole, that whole nervous thing before the second date, they're very nervous. So what if they don't show up? But Andy and the witness, they go make their way up to the pier and standing at the en- entrance, just these two heart-stoppingly beautiful German girls. And they're all dressed up. They got tight dresses on. And both men, both men are just astounded at their luck. They do the normal date stuff. They walk along the pier. They go get some food. They decide to go see a movie. The witness even remembers the movie that they saw, Bird on a Wire with Mel Gibson. Andy and the soldier kind of looked at each other and said, this, this is where we're going to figure out which girl likes which one of us. They made their way to the pier exit. But at this point, Andy does something very, very, very odd. Andy walks ahead of the group, the witness, the two girls, and starts to run across this large open road that's in front of them. The witness calls out to Andy. Andy ignores him, just continues to run towards the other side. This is the wrong direction. It's not not going anywhere near the cinema. The witness... mm, The witness apologizes. I'm, I'm so very sorry to the girls. Please stay where you are. I'm going to go chase after my idiot friend. He runs over to Andy. It's, it's, he, Andy's gotten about 60 feet away. The witness grabs Andy and says, What are you doing? Andy goes, I don't know. And he has no reason. He, he, can't even, he can't even rationalize what he's doing. But he's snapped out of it. They both turn around. They quickly head back to the girls. And they're nowhere to be seen. It was only 60 feet. The witness... The witness thinks they couldn't have been out of his view for more than 15 seconds. Brighton Pier, it's a long, wide, open road that stretches out a long distance. And if these girls were going to run away or hide, it would require some amount of running, especially in the dresses that they were wearing. Andy and the witness looked everywhere. They, they spent hours looking. The witness and Andy finally give up. He's, he's a little annoyed at Andy, and rightfully so. But they come up with a plan. Let's go back to Brighton Pier tomorrow. Same time. 
maybe the girls will show up. And they never did. The next day, Andy and the witness, his two other friends, they had to go elsewhere. And they never got the chance to speak to those two German girls again. Not long after, Andy and the witness lose touch. But 25 years later, they reunite. They tell a couple of war stories, have a couple of drinks, and then the topic of Brighton comes up. The witness and Andy, they discuss with each other what happened that night, and the witness is kind of hoping that Andy has a different perspective. Maybe, maybe he's remembering it wrong. Maybe they both are, and they can get to the truth. But Andy didn't have a different version of the story. And quite honestly, the witness and Andy, as they talked about it, they got a little spooked. I mean, the girls disappearing were one thing, but Andy to this day does not understand why he decided to walk away without reason. They don't know if these girls are alive, dead, imagination, paranormal. And forever, forever, they're left to the question, why? But I have a bigger question. What if, what if Andy wouldn't have run off? Instead of the two girls disappearing, I get, this, I get this sensation, I get this horrible feeling in the back of my mind that we wouldn't be talking about the two German girls disappearing. No, 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 no. I get the feeling that if Andy wouldn't have wandered off as he did, we'd be hearing the story of the two military men that disappeared at Brighton Pier. Our next tale comes from that same well that I keep going back to day after day after day. Phantomsandmonsters.com Now, we don't get a year that this happens, but it seems to be happening relatively recently. The witness, going by the name D.L., was driving her husband to work. It was a little bit after 4 p.m. daylight. And they were waiting for the light at an intersection in L.A. to turn green. They were the first car to stop at that light. And as traffic is passing them, going on down through that main highway, D.L.'s husband notices the driver of a red truck glancing in the direction of D.L. and her husband. This... This person in the red truck, it's an older gentleman, and he's wearing an, an oversized pair of aviator-style dark sunglasses. The driver turns to look at them. He's looking at them very, very intently. And D.L. and her husband... Notice that the driver's head morphs into a gray collar, a very flat face. This shape-shifting driver never, never breaks his gaze. Even though that red truck that he's driving is going around 55 miles an hour. When... When the driver can no longer see D.L. and her husband clearly, he turns his head very, 
very slowly forward. This incident shook up DL's husband so badly that for a few days after the incident, he avoided looking at cars for fear that other drivers would morph. He's got to be wondering, am I losing my mind? Was this a trick of the light? Was it a trick of speed? But DL's husband is absolutely convinced he has seen what he has seen. He's... He's so disturbed by this that he loses sleep. Now, DL, DL was perusing YouTube, looking at paranormal stuff. And she gets on to this video about the men in black. There was a there was a thumbnail that goes along with the video. You're, you more than likely have seen it. But then DL's husband sees this little thumbnail and goes, Oh my God, that's, that's really close to what the driver morphed into. I'll have this as the photo for this little section up on the YouTube channel. If you happen to not be on on YouTube, if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, that's fine too. Head over to the Facebook page, Strange Pathways, our Twitter account, our Instagram. There will be a copy of the photo up there for you to look at, along with a few other pictures dealing with today's tales. I wonder, as we make our way through our lives, just working, trying to get through another day, how many, how many people do we come in contact with that aren't what they seem? If it's to be believed, history is replete with entities around us. Be they ghostly, be they alien, be they otherworldly. We may be interacting with the supernatural on a daily basis and not even realize it. Four thousand years ago, the Sahara Desert looked very, very different. It teemed with vegetation, wildlife. It's, it was a glorious, beautiful place. And many legends have been passed down to those that live near the Sahara, especially if you find like the cities of Dakla, Farafa, Bahariya, these are all oasis cities near or in the Sahara. If you believe the legends that come out of those cities, then the Sahara used to be a bustling metropolis. Maybe, maybe, if you've been in the area, Maybe you've heard the tale of the city of Zerzura. References to this, this lost city of Zerzura. They've been discovered in 15th century Arabic manuscripts such as the Kitab al-Qunuz, also known as the Book of Hidden Pearls. This, according to the Book of Hidden Pearls, the city of Zerzura 
was magnificent, constructed from gleaming white stone and filled with treasure. The main entrance of this city was supposedly adorned with a carving of a bird clutching a key in its beak. Within the walls, the manuscripts say that the king and queen are sleeping. Maybe meaning that they have died and they found, found an eternal rest. But, read further into those manuscripts. And they'll talk about the colossal black giants who guarded the entrance of Zazura. In another document... A scribe from Benghazi, Libya, you can find an amazing tale coming from 1481. A camel caravan was heading to the Dakla Oasis and was caught in a horrible sandstorm. The only survivor of this vicious sandstorm was a man named Hamid Kila. When Keela emerged from this near-fatal storm, Keela looked around. All, all the landmarks were gone. He didn't, he didn't know where he was. But a group of strange men with blonde hair and blue eyes appeared out of nowhere. Instead of the curved Arab swords... They had straight swords, and they took Kila to their city, a city called Zerzura. Luxurious white houses, pools, ponds, palm trees. Fair-skinned women and children played and bathed. And the people of this city were kind. But, unfortunately, there was a language barrier. He didn't understand them, and they did not understand him. There were no mosques in the city. The women didn't wear clothes that covered their faces. Kila makes the assumption these are not Muslims. Kila had told this story to a lot of people. He was in Benghazi, and he told the emir of Benghazi about the mysterious city of Zazura. And the emir asks a very important question. He looks at Kila and goes, why did you leave? Kila pauses. And then he tells the emir that he had fled. And the emir goes, why did you run away? You were treated with kindness. Kila Kila says nothing. The emir orders a search of Kila, and a gold ring with a large ruby is found in his possession. The emir deduces that the reason Kila had to flee was he had stolen this beautiful ring from the Zazuras, and he had to flee. The law is vicious. Amir orders Kila to take them back out in the desert. Show them where this city is, or your hands will be cut off for theft. But Kila couldn't show the exact direction, and the Amir couldn't find the city. Whatever happened to Kila? is unknown. There are rumors that the ring, that beautiful golden ring with the ruby, that it, it fell into the hands of Muammar Gaddafi. Muammar Gaddafi had the ring studied by several experts, and they all came to the conclusion that it was made by European jewelry masters in the 12th century. Was the city of Zazura founded by descendants of 
early European crusaders who got lost in the desert on their way to Jerusalem or, or returning from Jerusalem? The possibility exists. If you want to go look for the city of Zazera, you can even get directions. In 1835, Egyptologist John Gardner Wilkinson wrote the topography of Thebes and the general view of Egypt. He had found the story of an Arab who had discovered the city of Zazera. It's two or three days journey west of Dakla, beyond which is another valley, and then another teeming with cattle, then Gababo and Tezerbo, and beyond them is Wadi Rabine. Gababo is inhabited by two tribes, the Simertain and the Ergersain. About five or six days' journey west of the road from El Hez to Farafra is another oasis called Wadi Zuzura, replete with palm trees, springs, and a few ruins of uncertain date. Now, this tome goes on to say, there are no blonde, blue-eyed Europeans living there. No, the residents are all black. It shouldn't be difficult to find, should it? 1909, explorer William Joseph Harding King went into the Sahara region to look for Zazura. He had, he had opened up several carcasses of birds that had flown in from the southwest. And he found olives in their stomachs. Now, according to a lot of accounts, Zazura is overgrown with palm trees and olive groves. And, and King was convinced that there was an oasis out there unknown to anyone. He did not find it. Six years later, John Ball, the director of Egyptian exploration, he tried to find Zazura. He found some clay pots, but no traces of the ruin of a lost city. The only real breakthrough in the search for Zazura occurred somewhere between 1932 and 1934. Ladislas E. Almazi, Robert Clayton, East Clayton, Hubert J. Penderall, and Patrick Clayton. They had reread Wilkinson's books, and they decided that the previous seekers had misinterpreted some of the directions. They went on that expedition. After six days of travel, they actually reached three green valleys in the northwestern part of the Gilf Kebir Plateau. That's pretty close to the border of Libya. And they found something that looked like the ruins of a stone building. There was some, some Egyptian hieroglyphics card. The, the name, the Pharaoh Jedrafra from the 4th Dynasty, was mentioned. Now, based on this, we, we establish a new time period for the Egyptians to be in the Western Sahara, but it was not Zazura. Some focus their attention on the Hamra Valley, it's, it's known for its vegetation. Others focus the three green valleys of Tal. There's probably a very good chance that Zazura is out there, but it's covered in hundreds of feet of sand. Thank you for joining us once again here on Strange Pathways. Go over to Redbubble in the link below. At least take a look at the t-shirt. It's fun. There's going to be a couple more t-shirts coming. So if this one isn't your cup of tea, maybe one later on down the road will be. Keep an eye out for that. If you are having mental health trouble dealing with a paranormal incident, reach out to the Opus Network, www.opusnetwork.org. They are there to help. And be sure to check out Whispers in the Abyss. It is a supposedly true, 
Very creepy tale that I found on Reddit. Please go over, enjoy that. It is a very different thing from Strange Pathways, but not so different that I think you're not going to enjoy it. Head over to our Twitter, Pathways Strange, our TikTok and Instagram, both Strange Pathways Podcast and our Facebook. I'll have a few images up there dealing with the tales that we talked about this week. Email us at strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. If you'd like to download the show, head over to Spotify. We have the show there. Or feel free to head over to YouTube where you can like, comment, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you once again for joining us here on Strange Pathways. Take care of yourselves and each other. Bye.